All right, very good morning, everyone, again. And hope you enjoyed your breakfast presentation and learned a lot more about sasituzumab in triple negative breast cancer. So uh, I'm Komal Jaberi, and I will be talking to you about lightning updates from major meetings. And the topic I chose to cover is targeting the estrogen receptor and androgen receptor for hormone receptor positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. These are my disclosures. So the outline for today's discussion is ER targeting strategies, and I'll briefly touch upon using novel endocrine agents such as oral CERDs. We covered a lot of it yesterday at the targeted therapy session. I'll focus on a couple of data sets that probably we did not cover in detail, and then maybe focus on role of oral CERDs in the early stage setting. And then we'll talk about other novel endocrine agents targeting ER, including the non cerd uh, agents. We covered lasofoxifene um, yesterday with uh, data from Elaine 1, Elaine 2, and the ongoing Elaine 3 trial. I'll cover PROTAC, which is proteolysis targeting chimera, CIRCA, which is serum estrogen receptor covalent antagonist, and CRAN, which is a complete estrogen receptor antagonist. And then we'll touch upon briefly how do we target AR for ER positive breast cancer. So quickly, just how does ER signaling even work, right? So the hormone receptor, in this case the estrogen receptor, has an activating function one domain, a ligand binding or an activating function two domain, and a DNA binding domain. And these are complex with HSP90 that maintains the receptor in an off state. Now once estradiol binds to the estrogen receptor, it triggers the release from HSP90 and that leads to receptor dimerization and then DNA engagement. And this DNA engagement that causes coordinated recruitment of cofactors and transcriptional machinery that drives gene expression changes. And we have three approved strategies that we use in clinic for our patients that target ER. We have aromatase inhibitors that inhibit the enzyme aromatase, which, con which actually is used to convert androgens to estrogen in the body. So the aromatase inhibitors inhibit that. So that's one way of uh, targeting ER. We have serum estrogen receptor modulators, or SERMs. The only approved agent that we currently use in clinic is tamoxifen. And this competes with estradiol to bind with the estrogen receptor and then inhibits the ER downstream transcription. And then we have the only serum estrogen receptor degrader or down regulator, fulvestrant, an intramuscular injection that we use for our patients in the metastatic setting, which not only inhibits the ER transcription, but also actually degrades the estrogen receptor itself. And certainly these have been very effective strategies we use for both early stage and late stage, but we've all recognized that there are limitations to them. And these limitations are not just to their toxicity profiles, but also their pharmacokinetic abilities. For example, with aromatase inhibitors, we had a great discussion yesterday on ESR1 mutations, and these occur under the selective pressure of aromatase inhibitors in the metastatic setting. And this leads to uh, conferring AF2 activity in the absence of estrogen, what we call as ligand-independent activation of the ER pathway. And certainly, we're very aware of the toxicities with these agents. Tamoxifen is a partial ER agonist, which manifests as a weaker ER suppressor. And we're aware of the toxicity profile of tamoxifen as well. Fulvestrant is approved in the metastatic setting and is active actually after patients have progressed on prior tamoxifen or prior aromatase inhibitors. However, it has its own pharmacological liabilities, including intramuscular injection, so lack of oral bioavailability. Its PK profile is poor. We know that the efficacy is dose dependent, but we're limited by the dose that we use in clinic, which is 500 milligrams intramuscular injection. Single agent fulvestrant activity, we briefly touched upon that yesterday as well, is very modest progression-free survival. It's only two months after patients progress on a CDK4-6 inhibitor in the metastatic setting. And so we certainly look for something that could be better than that. Additionally, I think, while we think that there are ESR1 mutations that potentially uh, fulvestrin can have activity for, some of these ESR1 mutations are not really uh, appropriate to be treated with a fulvestrin. At least some data have suggested that there is resistance to ESR1 Y537S mutations with fulvestrin, which is why we think about other agents. Additionally, I think a very important thing that we have to remember is that for our early stage patients, toxicity is really a big concern. 
And that really translates into non-adherence or non-compliance for our patients to tolerate these therapies for five to 10 years. And in fact, one population-based study by Don Hirschman and colleagues that was published in the JCO did show that about half of these patients do not complete their five years of assigned endocrine therapy in the adjuvant setting. So certainly we need something better, something that can be more tolerable and hopefully that can translate into better outcomes for our patients. Which is why we have many other novel endocrine agents that are currently in development. We spoke about that ER word salad, circas and CRANs, but the idea there with all of these novel therapies is, can we identify an optimal agent or more than one optimal agent that has a very good therapeutic index and can improve efficacy for our patients. So can we minimize the toxicity, overcome the pharmacologic issues that we just discussed, and can we improve outcomes for our patients? Now we talked about oral surge a little bit yesterday. We reviewed the data for Illacestran from the phase three Emerald trial yesterday. This is for metastatic setting, post-progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor. At San Antonio, we saw data from Serena 2, another oral cert, it's an AstraZeneca oral cert, very compelling da data. We saw that for patients that were treated on two different doses, 75 milligrams of note is the dose that is moving forward in phase three trials or is in phase three trials already. We saw that there was doubling of PFS from 3.7 months to 7.2 months. So here the numbers look really, really different and while it's statistically significant, when we, without doing cross-trial comparisons, it looks like it's better than Illacestran. I'll, I'll point your attention, 50% of the patients had received prior CDK4-6 in Serena 2, 100% had prior CDK4-6 in Emerald, and about um, uh, all patients did not receive prior fulvestrin. So these were fulvestrin naive patients. Again, driving the point that we were discussing yesterday, that perhaps if you have an endocrine-sensitive tumor that is homogeneously being treated, and if you have an ESR1 mutation, which kind of tells you that this is an ER-dependent tumor, maybe a single agent, optimal endocrine agent might do better. So this was good data that we saw, very encouraging for us to review. We have another agent, Imlunestrant. This is a Lilylox oncology medication. And when we looked at monotherapy in about 114 patients, median two prior lines, but when we focused on the post CDK4-6 pure second line setting, so fulvestrin naive, chemo naive, uh, potentially homogeneous patient population, also again, we saw the PFS is 6.5 months. At San Antonio, we presented the data in combination with abamaciclib, with or without an aromatase inhibitor. These are for CDK4-6 naive patient populations. And these two cohorts were randomized, but they were not meant to be compared to each other. The randomization was just, you know, the stratification factor was just for allocation to these therapies. What we did see is that the clinical benefit rate is about 80%, which is what we would expect with this combination. While the triplet with the aromatase inhibitor kind of looked a little better in terms of overall response rates, there were some differences in the patient populations in those cohorts. But I think what is really important to probably pay attention to is that the 12-month PFS rates and the clinical benefit rate for the doublet and the triplet were near identical. So I think this is an active combination. And EMBER-3 is currently ongoing. It's probably one of the largest um, phase three randomized studies post CDK4-6 inhibitor with an oral CERT that's currently ongoing and we don't have data for yet, uh, where patients get randomized to either oral CERT alone, to a physician choice endocrine therapy, and then there's also an arm for imlunestrian plus abamaciclib, again, driving the uh, you know, conversation about should we continue CDK4-6 as well? And so there is an opportunity on this study to study that question as well, especially if we show with single agent um, superiority to physician choice, then we will ungate to look at superiority of the combination with oral search. So this is ongoing. What about an early stage? Now, COOPERA is the trial on your left looking at the Genentech oral cert Girodestrand. Amida 4 is on your right looking at Amsenestrand, the Sanofi trial. Now, the Sanofi trial, I want to say Amsenestrand is no longer in development due to negative trials and, and futility that was announced even in the first-line metastatic study or the um, uh, 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 big study that was ongoing. But the idea here was in the neoadjuvant setting, to offer these therapies compared to physician choice, or in this case, actually an AI. So on your left, duodestrian compared to anastrozole for two weeks. 
on your right amsenes strand, two different doses compared to letrozole. And the primary endpoint was to look at change in T67 from baseline to week two in this window of opportunity phase for these two studies. And we did see differences. I think we were talking about this, that not all oral SIRDs are equal. You see on your left in the Coopera study, it met its primary endpoint with superior key 67 reduction from baseline to week two with geridestrand compared to anastrozole. We did not see that with amsenestrand. And we've seen this even with tamoxifen and AI and fulvestrin in early stage studies in the neoadjuvant setting, that those uh, patients who had a key 67 reduction actually land up having a better outcome in larger phase three adjuvant trials as well. So this was the idea of studying that because we know what anastrozole gives us and can this be a superior agent. So it did offer some signal and, and comfort that that is the case. This has led to last, large phase three adjuvant studies that are currently ongoing. On your left is the LIDERA trial, which is looking at girodestrian versus endocrine monotherapy for all patients with ER positive breast cancer upfront. So this is an upfront randomization trying to address is oral CERD better than endocrine therapy that we use in the adjuvant setting. On your right, Ember 4 is looking at a switch strategy. So these are patients who would have received two to five years of standard of care adjuvant endocrine therapy and at that point could be randomized to receiving an oral CERD versus continuing the regimen that they were on. And so these two strategies are currently ongoing in clinic, and we eagerly await what that would show us. Switching gears, talking about PROTAC, which is proteolysis targeting chimera. So this is showing you the mechanism of action. Basically, this is a molecule that targets one protein of interest, in this case, the estrogen receptor, and it also has a ligand for E3 ligase. And ultimately, this protein is then degraded to the ubiquitin uh, proteasomal pathway using this E3 ligase. ARV471 is the first in class PROTAC that has been studied in phase one clinical trial. This trial was reported out at San Antonio, 71 patients, three treated really, median three prior lines of therapy, all of them had prior CDK4-6 inhibitor. Nearly half, about 45% had prior chemotherapy and about 80% had prior fulvestrin. There were no DLTs, some mild grade one or two toxicities of nausea, fatigue, arthralgia, hot flashes or AST increases. Responses were seen with prior CDK4-6, fulvestrin, or even investigational oral surgeons in this trial. The clinical benefit rate was about 38%, 51% in the ESR1 mutant patient population. A phase three trial, Veritac 2, is ongoing with that study. Another chimeric degrader is AC0682. Idea being between these agents when we're thinking about them, with novel SIRDs, we know that there is some degradation with SIRDs, but the mechanism of degradation is rather elusive in some ways. But with a chimeric degrader, the difference is there is a clearly defined catalytic mechanism by design. As we went over, it's the E3 ligase and the proteasomal dependent degradation. And what we've seen, at least preclinically, is that ER degradation is deeper with these chimeric degraders compared to the novel oral SIRDs. So a phase one trial of this novel agent is also ongoing in clinics, so early days, and we'll have to wait to see what that shows. Moving on to selective estrogen receptor antagonist, or CIRCA. So CIRCAs are you know, a covalent antagonist that target a unique cysteine in the estrogen receptor. And a particular position of the cysteine is 530 that is not conserved in the nuclear hormone receptors. There is equipotent targeting. It is equipotent in targeting both the wild type and the mutant in, in vitro and uh, other xenograft models. And the first in-class agent here is H3B6545, which was originally developed by H3 Biomedicine and currently by ASI. And this really showed that it binds estrogen uh, receptor irreversibly and enforces this novel antagonist conformation without degrading the estrogen receptor. So it also has uh, activity in combination with palbociclib. And these are data from the phase one trial of this agent with, again, very heavily pretreated patient population, median three prior lines, about 87% prior CDK4-6, 73% prior fulvestrin, 50% prior chemotherapy, and we did see that the overall response rate in this pretreated population was 17%, clinical benefit rate of about 40%, and the median PFS is nearly four months. 
What was very interesting, and this is the only novel agent that has reported this, that of the ESR1 mutation, specifically in the ESR1 Y537S, this, which was about 10 patients on this study, the median PFS with H3B6545 was 7.3 months. It did have some interesting signals of uh, adverse events, including some low-grade bradycardia and some uh, QT prolongation that were seen. We do not understand the pathophysiology for these side effects. However, luckily, these were low-grade and not very clinically significant. Last, we have CRAN, which is a complete estrogen receptor antagonist. Again, when we think about the estrogen receptor, we talked about the AF1 and the AF2 uh, uh, domains. And so when we're thinking about tamoxifen, tamoxifen is a partial antagonist where we think about it turn offs the AF2 domain, but not necessarily the activity through AF1. And the idea behind developing ER antagonists is that hopefully we can get both AF1 and AF2 activity inhibited. And that's what a complete ER antagonist is supposed to do. OP1250 is such an agent. Again, phase one trial data here, 41 patients, very pretreated, 37% had three or more lines of therapy in the metastatic setting. Nearly almost all patients had CDK4-6 inhibitor, about 70% trial fulvestrin, 40% trial chemotherapy, and we did see the overall response rate is about 17% again here as well. Clinical benefit, again, similar to other agents that we've seen, about 46%. And here we saw some interesting um, uh, toxicity signals as well. We did not see the bradycardia and the ocular toxicity that we saw with the H3B or some other uh, novel oral surds that have reported those out as well. So combinations are currently ongoing, including with palbociclib, and there is combination that were planned uh, for late last year with ribociclib and alpelacid, and that study will be enrolling soon. So to summarize what we learned from ER targeting agents, that these agents are in development, oral surge being you know, the furthest in development in phase three studies, we might have one approved very soon. But with the other agents, I think the ultimate selection of what we will think about if we have a few agents approved is what was the optimal therapeutic index, what was the toxicity profile, what was the efficacy, and what patient population might best benefit from single agent and combination trials are currently ongoing. We also want to start thinking about, can we start sequencing these agents better? And is there a better sequence that one can use? What are the mechanisms of resistance to these agents? We're beginning to understand that with our current agents, such as AIs and tamoxifen, do we know that about these agents? But ultimately, I think we have to also remember that they are only focused on targeting the ligand binding mutation uh, 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 dependencies, so ESR1 mutation. But for the other endocrine resistance mechanisms, we will still need other agents. And so we might have to evaluate combinations with this so-called optimal endocrine agents that are in development. Let's move on to targeting AR really briefly here. So AR positivity is actually um, uh, present in about up to 90% of HR positive breast cancer. But its role really depends on the tumor microenvironment as well as the relative levels of circulating estrogens and androgens. And so AR expression is often associated with a favorable prognosis, but many findings also suggest that in some instances, high levels of AR can actually contribute to therapy resistance. And so really, when we think about it, it can stimulate or inhibit cellular proliferation and promote metastases and resistance to therapies in HR-positive cells. And these opposing actions depend on the multitude of proteins and what interactions are seen with AR and ER. Now, multiple AR antagonists were uh, studied for ER positive, AR positive breast cancer, and this is a table summarizing the data for all of them. I'm not gonna go over all of these, but the largest one was the one which looked at enzalutamide plus eczemestane versus placebo plus eczemestane, the third row here. And in those 247 patients, on your top you see in that table that those patients that did not have prior endocrine therapy we saw that the PFS in the intent to treat population was about 11.8 months, and in the AR positive patient population, the combination of enzalutamide and eczemestane yielded a PFS of 16.5 months. In purple, you'll see those without prior endocrine therapy, we really don't see a difference between single agent eczemestane and the combination with enzalutamide. What about AR agonists? Now, AR agonists are also being studied for HR positive breast cancer. 
And when we think about AR agonists, they are trying to displace the ER and the transcriptional cofactors of ER, and this is how they're trying to uh, uh, take over, if you will, the growth of the ER positive cells. And when we think about the AR uh, agonists, AR targeted genes are also upregulated in these tumors. If we have tumors that have AR targeted genes upregulated, again, they're taking away the co transcriptional factors from ER. And these, some, some of these genes are also tumor suppressor genes, so they can inhibit the growth of ER, and which is why AR agonists are also being evaluated now. And one such attractive agent was Inobosarm that was uh, studied. It is a non steroidal selective androgen receptor agonist that really inhibits AR positive, HR positive cells, both in cell lines and PDX models. It is not a substrate for aromatase. It's anabolic on the muscle and builds and heals bone. It's selective tissue activity. And extensive non-clinical clinical package has been uh, uh, evaluated in about 27 clinical trials with over 2,000 patients with this drug. And so this was studied in a phase two trial which evaluated the efficacy and safety of Inobosarm at two separate doses, nine and 18 milligrams, in heavily pretreated AR positive, what was defined as more than 10% ER positive tumors, who previously responded to endocrine therapy. Really, the evaluable population here was about uh, uh, 50 patients, nine milligrams, and 52 patients studied on 18 milligrams. And these are the uh, patient characteristics for those cohorts bone only patients with about 38% in the nine milligram cohort. About both um, eight, nine and 18 milligrams had uh, prior chemotherapy in 90% of the patients and median two prior lines of endocrine therapy prior to enrollment on this study. And these are the waterfall plot and the efficacy data for the uh, phase two study at both cohorts. Nearly about 30% clinical benefit rate seen at both doses. What was interesting is that the cut point of 40% AR expression was considered to be optimal. So they went back and looked at AR expression and they thought that the activity was better with that cut point, which is the cut point they're utilizing in the registrational phase three trial, the RTES trial of Inobasarm versus Eximestane or CIRM in patients with AR positive, ER positive that had CDK4-6 inhibitor, at least in the metastatic setting. So targeting AR as monotherapy or in combination with conventional therapies are increasingly being investigated. Novel AR agonists have activity in pretreated but ET-sensitive HR-positive patients. So one would question, how do we think about utilizing AR antagonists or AR agonists? I think we could think about utilizing both, but we have to think about for who. So when we think about ET-naive patients, that have high ER mRNA, particularly in combination with the low ESR1 mRNA, they may benefit from an AR blocker. When we think about ET heavily pretreated patients with high AR and ESR1 mutations may benefit from an AR antagonist. So context matters when we think about AR antagonists and ER agonists. That's my last slide. Thank you so much for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Questions? I don't have a question, I just have a comment. Yes. Um, I can keep it pretty quick. Um, the phase three, the phase three our test trial that uh, Dr. Javeri just talked to us about is open at Miami Cancer Institute. So um, if you'd like to refer patients for that study, it sounds exciting. Yeah, so I think again, it's for patients who've had at least a CDK4-6 inhibitor and a second line endocrine therapy yeah, yeah, combination is also allowed. So you could have had technically a alpelisib or a Evrolimus treated patient and then they would be tested for AR and they could get, get on that study. So do think about that study. It's an attractive option and a good agent. Thank you, Reshma. So if no more questions, I think we can move on with our day. <laughs>